right, so beginning at page 124, self-titled, To the River. Faber, another rap, a whisper, and a long waiting. Then after a minute, a small light flickered inside Faber's small house. After another pause, the back door opened. They stood looking at each other in the half-light, Faber and Montag, as if each did not believe in the other's existence. Then Faber moved and put out his hand and grabbed Montag and moved him in, and sat him down and went back and stood in the door, listening. The sirens were wailing off in the morning distance, he came in and shut the door. Montag said, I've been a fool all down the line. I can't stay long. I'm on my way, God knows where. At least you were a fool about the right things, said Faber. I thought you were dead. The audio capsule I gave you burnt. I heard the captain talking to you and suddenly there was nothing. I almost came out looking for you. The captain's dead. He found the audio capsule. He heard your voice. He was going to trace it. I killed him with the flamethrower. Faber sat down and did not speak for a time. My God, how did this happen? said Montag. It was only the other night everything was fine, and the next thing I know, I'm drowning. How many times can a man go down and still be alive? I can't breathe. There's Beatty dead, and he was my friend once. And there's Millie gone. I thought she was my wife, but now I don't know. And the house all burnt, and my job gone, and myself on the run. And I planted a book in a fireman's house on the way. Good Christ, the things I've done in a single week. You did what you had to do. It was coming on for a long time. Yes, I believe that, if there's nothing else I believe. It saved itself up to happen. I could feel it for a long time. I was saving something up. I went around doing one thing and filling another. It was all there. It's a wonder it didn't show on me like fat. And now, here I am, messing up your life too. They might follow me here. I feel alive for the first time in years, said Faber. I feel I'm doing what I should have done a lifetime ago. For a little while, I'm not afraid. Maybe it's because I'm doing the right thing at last. Maybe it's because I've done a rash thing and don't want to look the coward to you. I suppose I'll have to do even more violent things, exposing myself so I won't fall down on the job and turn scared again. What are your plans? To keep running. You know the war's on. I heard. God, isn't it funny, said the old man. It seems so remote because we have our own troubles. I haven't had time to think. Montag drew out a hundred dollars. I want this to stay with you. Use it any way that'll help when I'm gone. But I might be dead by no noon. Use this. Faber nodded. You'd better head for the river if you can. Follow along it. And if you can hit the old railroad lines going out into the country, follow them. Even though practically everything's airborne these days and most of the tracks are abandoned, the rails are still there rusting. I've heard there are still hobo camps all across the country, here and there. Walking camps, they call them. And if you keep walking far enough and keep an eye peeled, they say there's lots of old Harvard degrees on the tracks between here and Los Angeles. Most of them are wanted and hunted in the cities. They survive, I guess. There aren't many of them, and I guess the government's never considered them a great enough danger to go in and track them down. You might hold up with them for a time and get in touch with me in St. Louis. I'm leaving on the 5 a.m. bus this morning to see a retired printer there. I'm getting out in the open myself at last. This money will be put to good use. Thanks, and God bless you. Do you want to sleep a few minutes? I'd better run. Let's check. He took Montag quickly into the bedroom and lifted a picture frame aside revealing a television screen the size of a postal card. I've always wanted something very small, something I could walk to, something I could blot out with the palm of my hand, if necessary. Nothing that could shout me down, nothing monstrous big. So you see, he snapped it on. Montag, the TV set said, and it lit up. M-O-N-T-A-G. The name was spelled out by a voice. Guy Montag, still running. Police helicopters are up. A new mechanical hound has been brought from another district. Montag and Faber looked at each other. Mechanical hound never fails. Never since its first use in tracking quarry has this incredible invention made a mistake. Tonight, this network is proud to have the opportunity to follow the hound by camera helicopters. It starts on its way to the target. Faber poured two glasses of whiskey. We'll need these. They drank. 
No, so sensitive the mechanical hound can remember and identify 10,000 odor indexes on 10,000 men without resetting. Faber trembled the least bit and looked about at his house, at the walls, the door, the doorknob, and the chair where Montag now sat. Montag saw the look. They both looked quickly about the house and Montag felt his nostrils dilate. And he knew that he was trying to track himself and his nose was suddenly good enough to sense the path he had made in the air of the room. And the sweat of his hand hung from the doorknob, invisible but as numerous as the jewels of a small chandelier. He was everywhere, in and on and about everything. He was a luminous cloud, a ghost that made breathing once more impossible. He saw Faber stop up his own breath for fear of drawing that ghost into his own body, perhaps being contaminated with the phantom exhalations and odors of a running man. The mechanical hound is now landing by helicopter at the site of the burning. And there on the small screen was the burnt house and the crowd and something with a sheet over it. And out of the sky, fluttering, came the helicopter like a grotesque flower. So they must have their game out, thought Montag. The circus must go on, even with war beginning within the hour. He watched the scene, fascinated not wanting to move. It seemed so remote and no part of him. It was a play of parts and separate, wondrous to watch, not without its strange pleasure. That's all for me, you thought. That's all taking place just for me, by God. If he wished, he could linger here in comfort and follow the entire hunt on through its swift phases, down alleys, across streets, over empty running avenues, crossing lots and playgrounds, with pauses here or there for the necessary commercials, up other alleys to the burning house of Mr. and Mrs. Black, and so on finally to this house, with Faber and himself seated, drinking while the electric hounds snuffed down the last trail, silent as a drift of death itself, skidding to a halt outside that window there. Then, if he wished, Montag might rise, walk to the window, keep one eye on the TV screen, open the window, lean out, Look back and see himself dramatized, described, made over, standing there, limbed in the bright small television screen from outside, a drama to be watched objectively, knowing that in other parlors he was large as life, in full color, dimensionally perfect. And if he kept his eye peeled quickly, he would see himself an instant before oblivion, being punctured for the benefit of how many civilian parlor sitters who had been awakened from sleep a few minutes ago by the frantic sirening of their living room walls to come and watch the big game, the hunt, the one-man carnival? Would he have time for a speech? As the hound seized him, in view of 10 or 20 or 30 million people, mightn't he sum up his entire life in the last week in one single phrase, or word that would stay with them long after the hound had turned? clenching him in its metal pliar jaws and trotted off in darkness while the camera remained stationary, watching the creature dwindle in the distance, a splendid fade out. What could he say in a single word, a few words, that would sear all their faces and wake them up? There, whispered Faber, out of a helicopter gl glided something that was not machine, not animal, not dead, not alive, glowing with a pale green luminosity stood near the smoking ruins of Montag's house and the men brought his discarded flamethrower to it and put it down under the muzzle of the hound. There was a whirring, clicking, humming. Montag shook his head and got up and drank the rest of his drink. It's time. I'm sorry about this. About what? Me? My house? I deserve everything. Run, for God's sake. Perhaps I can delay them here. Wait. There's no use you being discovered. When I leave, burn the spread of this bed that I touched. Burn the chair in the living room and your wall incinerator. Wipe down the furniture with alcohol. Wipe the doorknobs. Burn the throw rug in the parlor. Turn the air conditioning on full in all the rooms and spray with moss spray if you have it. Then, turn on your lawn sprinklers as high as they'll go and hose off the sidewalks. With any luck at all, we can kill the trail in here anyway. Faber shook his head. I'll tend to it. Good luck. If we're both in good health next week, the week after, get in touch. General Delivery, St. Louis. I'm sorry there's no way I can go with you this time by earphone. That was good for both of us, but my equipment is limited. You see, I never thought I would use it. What a silly old man. No thought there, stupid, stupid. So I haven't another green bullet, the right kind, to put in your head. Go now. One last thing, a quick, a suitcase, get it. Fill it with your dirtiest clothes, an old suit, the dirtier the better, a shirt, some old sneakers and socks. 
Faber was gone and back in a minute. They sealed the cardboard valise with clear tape. To keep the ancient odor of Mr. Faber in, of course, said Faber, sweating at the job. Montag doused the exterior of the valise with whiskey. I don't want that hound picking up two odors at once. May I take this whiskey? I'll need it later. Christ, I hope this works. They shook hands again and going out the door glanced at the TV. The hound was on its way, followed by hovering helicopter cameras, silently, silently sniffing the great night wind. It was running down the first alley. Goodbye. And Montag was out the back door lightly, running with the half-empty valise. Behind him he heard the lawn sprinkling system jump up, filling the dark air with rain that fell gently and then with a steady pour all about washing on the sidewalks and draining into the alley. He carried a few drops of this rain with him on his face. He thought he heard the old man call goodbye, but he wasn't certain. He ran very fast away from the house down toward the river. Montag ran. He could feel the hound like autumn come cold and dry and swift, like a wind that didn't stir grass, that didn't jar windows or disturb leaf shadows on the white sidewalks as it passed. The hound did not touch the world. It carried its silence with it. So you could feel the silence building up a pressure behind you all across town. Montag felt the pressure rising and ran. He stopped for breath on his way to the river to peer through dimly lit windows of wakened houses and saw the silhouettes of people inside watching their parlor walls. And there on the walls, the mechanical hound, a breath of neon vapor spidered along, here and gone, here and gone. Now at Elm Terrace, Lincoln, Oak Park, and up the alley toward Faber's house. Go past, thought Montag, don't stop, go on, don't turn in. On the parlor wall, Faber's house with its sprinkler system pulsing in the night air, the hound paused, quivering. No, Montag held to the window sill. This way, here. Proking needle flicked out and in, out and in. A single clear drop of the stuff of dreams fell from the needle as it vanished in the mound's muzzle. Montag held his breath like a doubled fist in his chest. The mechanical hound turned and plunged away from Faber's house down the alley again. Montag snapped his gaze to the sky. The helicopters were closer a great blowing of insects to a single light source. With an effort, Montag reminded himself again that this was no fictional episode to be watched on his run to the river. It was in actuality his own chess game he was witnessing, move by move. He shouted to give himself the necessary push away from this last house window and the fascinating seance going on in there. Hell, and he was away, gone. The alley, a street, the alley, a street, and the smell of the river. Leg out, leg down, leg out and down. 20 million Montags running. Soon, if the cameras caught him, 20 million Montags running, running like an ancient flickery keystone comedy. Cops, robbers, chasers in the chase, hunters and hunted. He had seen it a thousand times. Behind him now, 20 million silently baying hounds ricocheted across parlors. Three cushions shooting from right wall to center wall to left wall, gone. Right wall, center wall, left wall, gone. Montag jammed his seashell into his ear. Police suggest entire population in the Elm Terrace area do as follows. Everyone, in every house, in every street, open a front or rear door or look from the windows. The fugitive cannot escape if everyone in the next minute looks from his house. Ready? Of course. Why hadn't they done it before? Why in all the years hadn't this game been tried? Everyone up, everyone out. He couldn't be missed. The only man running alone in the night city. The only man proving his legs. At the count of ten now. One. Two. He felt the city rise. Three. He felt the city turn to its thousands of doors. Four. People sleepwalking in their hallways. Five. He felt their hands on the doorknobs. The smell of the river was cool and like a solid rain. His throat was burnt rust and his eyes were wet dry with running. He yelled as if this yell would jet him on, fling him the last hundred yards. Six, seven, eight. The doorknobs turned on 5,000 doors. Nine. He ran out away from the last row of houses on a slope leading down to a solid moving blackness. Ten. The doors opened. He imagined thousands on thousands of faces peering into yards, into alleys, and into the sky. Faces hid by curtains pale, night-frightened faces, like gray animals peering from electric caves, faces with gray, colorless eyes, gray tongues and gray thoughts looking out through the numb flesh of the face. But he was at the river. 
touched it, just to be sure it was real. He waded in and stripped in darkness to the skin, splashed his body, body, arms, legs, and head with raw liquor, drank it and snuffed some up his nose. Then he dressed in Favor's old clothes and shoes. He tossed his own clothing into the river and watched it swept away. Then, holding the suitcase, he walked out in the river until there was no bottom and he was swept away in the dark. He was 300 yards downstream when the hound reached the river. Overhead, the great racketing fans of the helicopters hovered. A storm of light fell upon the river and Montag dived under the great illumination as if the sun had broken the clouds. He felt the river pulling further on its way into darkness. Then the light switched back to the land. The helicopters swerved over the city again as if they had picked up another trail. They were gone. The hound was gone. Now there was only the cold river and Montag floating in a sudden peacefulness, away from the city and the lights and the chase, away from everything. He felt as if he had left a stage behind and many actors. He felt as if he had left the great seance and all the murmuring ghosts. He was moving from an unreality that was frightening into a reality that was unreal because it was new. The black land slid by and he was going into the country among the hills. For the first time in a dozen years, the stars were coming out above him in great processions of willing fire. He saw a great juggernaut of stars form in the sky and threatened to roll over and crush him. He floated on his back when the valise filled and, and sank. The river was mild and leisurely, going away from the people who ate shadows for breakfast and steam for lunch and vapors for supper. The river was very real. It held him comfortably and gave him the time at last the leisure to consider this month, this year, and a lifetime of years. He listened to his heart slow. His thoughts stopped rushing with his blood. He saw the moon low in the sky now, the moon there, and the light of the moon caused by what? By the sun, of course. And what lights the sun? Its own fire. And the sun goes on day after day, burning and burning. The sun in time, the sun in time burning, burning. The river bobbled him along gently, burning. The sun in every clock on the earth. It all came together and became a single thing in his mind. After a long time of floating on the land and a short time of floating in the river, he knew why he must never burn again in his life. The sun burned every day. It burned time. The world rushed in a circle and turned on its axis and time was busy burning the years and the people anyway, without any help from him. So if he burned things with the firemen and the sun burned time, that meant that everything burned. One of them had to stop burning. The sun wouldn't, certainly. So it looked as if it had to be Montag and the people he had worked with until a few short hours ago. Somewhere the saving and putting away had to begin again and someone had to do the saving and keeping one way or another, in books, and records, in people's heads, any way at all, so long as it was safe, free from moss, silverfish, rust and dry rock, and men with matches. The world was full of burning and of all types and sizes. Now the guild of the Avestos Weaver must open shop very soon. He felt his heel bump land, touch pebbles and rocks, scrape sand. The river had moved him toward shore. He looked in at the great black creature without eyes or light, without shape, with only a size that went a thousand miles, without wanting to stop with its grass hills and forests that were waiting for him. He hesitated to leave the comforting flow of the water. He expected the hound there. Suddenly the trees might blow under a great wind of helicopters. But there was only the normal autumn wind high up, going by like another river. Why wasn't the hound running? Why had the search veered inland? Montag listened. Nothing. Nothing. Millie, he thought. All this country here. Listen to it. Nothing and nothing. So much silence, Millie. I, I wonder how you take it. Would you shout, shut up, shut up? Millie. Millie. And he was sad. Millie was not here and the hound was not here. But the dry smell of hay blowing from some distant field put Montag on the land. He remembered a farm he had visited when he was very young. One of the rare few times he discovered that somewhere behind the seven veils of unreality, beyond the walls of parlors and beyond the tin moat of the city, cows chewed grass and pigs sat in warm ponds at noon and dogs barked after white sheep on a hill. 
now the dry smell of hay. The motion of the waters made him think of sleeping in fresh hay in a lonely barn away from the loud highways, behind a quiet farmhouse and under an ancient windmill that whirled like the sound of the passing years overhead. He lay in the high barn for loft all night, listening to distant animals and insects and trees, the little motions and stirrings. During the night, he thought, below the loft, he would hear a sound like feet moving, perhaps. He would tense and sit up. Sound would move away. He would lie back and look out the loft window, very late in the night, and see the lights go out in the farmhouse itself, until a very young and beautiful woman would sit in an unlit window, braiding her hair. It would be hard to see her, but her face would be like the face of the girl so long ago and has passed now, so very long ago. The girl who had known the weather and never been burned by the fireflies, the girl who had known what dandelions meant rubbed off on your chin. Then she would be gone from the warm window and appear again upstairs in her moon-whitened room. And then to the sound of death, the sound of the jets cutting the sky in two black pieces beyond the horizon, he would lie in the loft, hidden and safe, watching those strange, strange new stars over the rim of the earth, fleeing from the soft color of dawn. In the morning, he would not have needed sleep, for all the warm odors and sights of a complete country night would have rested and slept him while his eyes were wide in his mouth. When he thought to test it, it was half a smile. And there at the bottom of the hayloft stair waiting for him would be the incredible thing. He would step carefully down in the pink light of early morning, so fully aware of the world that he would be afraid, and stand over the small miracle and at last bend to touch it. A cool glass of fresh milk and a few apples and pears laid at the foot of the steps. This was all he wanted now. Some sign that the immense world would accept him and give him the long time he needed to think all the things that must be thought. A glass of milk, an apple, a pear. He stepped from the river. The land rushed at him, the tidal wave. He was crushed by darkness and the look of the country and the million odors on a wind that iced his body. He fell back under the breaking curve of darkness and sound and smell, his eyes roaring, his ears roaring. He whirled. The stars poured over his sight like flaming meteors. He wanted to plunge in the river again and let it idle him safely on down somewhere. This dark land rising was like that day in his childhood, swimming when from nowhere the largest wave in the history of remembering slammed him down in salt mud and green darkness, water burning mouth and nose, retching his stomach, screaming, too much water, too much land. Out of the black wall before him a whisper, a shape. In the shape, two eyes. The night looking at him, the forest seeing him, the hound. After all the running and rushing and sweating it out and half drowning, to come this far, work this hard, and think yourself safe and sigh with relief and come out on the land at last only to find the hound? Montag gave one last agonized shout as if this were too much for any man. The shape exploded away. The eyes vanished. The leaf piles flew up in a dry shower. Montag was alone in the wilderness. All right.